We're here at Solutions House, and Solutions House has a motto of answers only. Now that that's a motto is a, a way is a reminder rather than a rule, and it's a reminder that now in 2022, it's important for us to look at the problems for only so long as needed to come up with the solutions, because this must be a solutions economy. In fact, this must be the solutions decade that we're working in now, which is why Solutions House exists. And Solutions House is co-convened by Futella. Um, and in fact, these are Futella's offices on a normal day. <laughs> so a week ago, this was filled with uh, chairs and desks and Futellans beavering away. So thank you so much to the Futellans who, who are here for letting us have the office um, for this week. And it's also another of our partners is the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, who is co-convener of Solutions House, and also Google. And I want to thank um, thank of our partners in Solutions House for making this happen. And in fact, when we had the idea for this, should we say eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, uh, what we realised is that between Futera's clients, and there's some great clients who are here, Exponential Roadmap Initiative members, and of course Google's partners, we had an enormous number of solutionists that we could gather together quite quickly in this space to talk about how to reach 1.5 and how to halve emissions, um, uh, well, halve emissions by 2030. I've got a few housekeeping notes for this lovely space, which I'm going to make sure to go through. So uh, we are not expecting a fire alarm. It did not go off in the first session. Let's hope it does not go off in the second session. If it should go off, please follow someone with a answers only uh, yellow t-shirt calmly walking down the stairs, stairway A there, or uh, the stairway at the back. And then we will reconvene in front of the building, um, this and this and behind. There are two bathrooms at the back. Um, one of them is an accessible bathroom. Um, and one of the things which really bothers me when I go to sessions is this idea that somehow human beings should sit without moving for sort of an hour and a half without a loo break. So please get up, use the bathrooms. There's white noise machines in there. So, so please respect the human and make sure that you are, um, you're enjoying yourself whilst you're here. If you need any help or have any questions, there's wonderful folks wearing um, uh, Solutions House Answers Only t-shirts who will be happy to help. Um, Wi-Fi. If you'd like to get onto the Wi-Fi, uh, look for Solutions House, either, three, either 2G or 5G, depending on what you want to use Wi-Fi for. And the password is Answers Only, capital A, capital O. So Answers Only, Wi-Fi. And if you do go onto the Wi-Fi, I would really hope that you might use it to, uh, to tweet or LinkedIn or any other platform of your choice um, any thoughts about the sessions which we're having here today. And you'll see the hashtags for that at the back of your chairs. It's hashtag Solutions House and hashtag Climate Week NYC. Um, and please do share everything that inspires or challenges you, what you agree with and what you disagree with here at Solutions House. Um, I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to my co-convener and co-presenter and co-organiser, uh, Johan Falk, for this amazing conversation we're going to have about the very, very, very tricky subject of supply chains and how can we halve emissions by 2030. Thank you, Sylvie. And <clears throat> amazing that we managed to pull this off in eight weeks. It shows that it was maybe a crazy idea, but I think it's... Uh, Fantastic where you see all the events lined up, focusing on solutions. One of the uh, key strategies in order to scale the solutions exponentially will be to reinvent the supply chains. So that's the second pillar of the playbook, which we launched in the previous session. You should bring one with you. So that is what we will focus on today. And uh, we have this work. Okay. 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 There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So as you can see, we, <coughs> we have uh, amazing people here from different companies who will specifically focusing on uh, how we are reinventing supply chains with a focus to harm emissions by 2030. And we run this through three uh, particular themes. The first one is how can we scale uh, climate action among companies? How can we get a sufficient number of companies actually starting to set the same compass direction? So that is basically the first question. The other is focusing in on one of the hotspots, which is renewable energy. How can we actually scale renewable energy and electricity through the supply chain? We have two of the leading companies, Ikea and Apple, who will share their experiences and discuss how can we scale these practices uh, much faster. And the third one is about really rethinking the complete value chain and uh, drive radical innovation. We need to get much more disruptors into our value chain. We can't just rely on the existing uh, supply chains and value chains. We really need to apply innovation in all aspects. So that's the third part, where we have uh, Polestar and Houdini, which I think are two excellent examples of best practices, which can be copied by anyone. And um, yeah, just briefly about the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. We bring together innovators, transformers, taking action in line with the 1.5 ambition to halve emissions by 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions. And uh, we gather a number of companies and organizations, uh, both scientific organizations, NGOs, as well as uh, leading companies. We have very sharp requirements, I would say the sharpest to onboard companies uh, to join the Exponential Roadmap Initiative among all initiatives. So our idea is to drive from the front. And one of the initiatives uh, within the Exponential Roadmap Initiative that we set up is the 1.5 uh, supply chain leaders. And I'd like uh, uh, Laura Perez, who is Senior Project Manager for the Supply Chain Leaders, to give a few highlights on the work by the Supply Chain Leaders. Welcome. Thank you. Hi everybody, good morning and welcome to the Solutions House. Thank you very much everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Laura, working for the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and I will just talk very briefly about the Supply Chain Leaders. I do understand it is, a it is a mouthful, supply chain leaders, but I can tell you it's definitely worth it remembering. The supply chain leaders is this group of companies that you can see here in this screen, uh, and they have all committed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions throughout their value chains in line with the 1.5 degree ambition. Understanding the fact that they need to work with their suppliers, considering also their SMEs, to half emissions by 2030 and to be net zero by the latest of 2050. This group of 15 companies here work together to set strategies and to really become with the best practices in order to manage on how we see that we can engage with the suppliers. Something very important to note here about this group is that there are no pledges allowed. We're not talking pledges, we're talking action. And this is what the supply chain leaders is all about. We act. We don't say we act. Um, but how is it? Next, please. How is it that we do this? Well, in a nutshell, we basically work together all the companies that you saw previously, and we develop guides on, for example, how is it that we can accelerate the access to renew renewable electricity for corporates? How is it that we can do that? In terms of guidelines, for example, how can we engage with our suppliers? How can we manage for our suppliers to get uh, realistic 1.5 aligned targets? All of these, we bring it together and we compile it in a tool that later on Diana will cover a little bit more, uh, called the Supplier Engagement Guide. There is a bunch of tools, the Business Playbook has been mentioned, there are webinars, that we have that are easily accessible, all of them for free, on the Supplier Engagement Guide, and also we have the SME Climate Hub that support the SMEs. In a nutshell, I'm finishing now. 
What we try to do with the 1.5 supply chain leaders is really to make climate solutions simpler, accessible, and cheaper for all corporates, because we all need to be together on this. Thank you very much. Over to you, Yuan. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, I'm fine. I, yeah. I don't need a mic. I'm just, I'm just going to share. So, um, so, thank you so very much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to ask Diane now from uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development to come up and talk a little bit around um, you know, how do we do this practically? How do we actually make this work um, in terms of the, in terms of the, the, the supply and engagement vision? Hi everybody, so I'm Diana Wilkinson from, from BSR. Um, so you know, I think I'll, I'll start off today by reiterating something I'm sure most of you uh, are well aware of. Also, should I stand? Is that better? Maybe you both can't see. Okay. Um, so value chains obviously at this point, I think all of us know make up a disproportionate amount of companies' emissions. So I think at this point we know somewhere uh, around 10 or 11 times the emissions are held in scope three rather than scope one and two. Um, and I think we all know also that emissions need to drastically reduce now. You know, I say that from a nearly 80 degree record heat day in New York in late September. Um, and you know, if we're, if we're looking to reach our 1.5 goal, um, we need to take that drastic action today. And, and given that the bulk of emissions are happening in the value chain, um, that's not something that we can do alone. Um, so we have to really work together. And this collaborative approach uh, really makes sense because many companies actually share suppliers, share geographies. And so if we want to raise the bar globally, we have to do so together. Um, this is a global economy, global climate. Um, and so, so what I'm going to focus today is the collaborative approach um, on, on helping companies decarbonize a complex value chain. Um, so supply chains have specific issues that don't necessarily exist in scope one and two, um, you know, dealing with sort of transparency issues, monitoring, incentivization, leverage issues with suppliers. All of those are, are really tough challenges uh, that we need to pull best practices from, uh, from companies all over to really help get those solutions. So enter kind of the 1.5 supply chain leaders and the supplier engagement guide. And uh, you know, so the supplier engagement guide that you'll find it's on the Exponential Roadmap website um, is something that was produced in tandem with a number of partners, including BSR. Uh, but it's a freely accessible, practical guide uh, that goes over kind of step-by-step -step instructions on how suppliers can work to decarbonize. Um, and we are obviously working towards that 1.5 vision, but I think what sets this apart as a really useful tool is that it's taking practical examples that come from leading companies and giving like actual documentation and how-to guides. Uh, so this is really focused towards probably professionals that are working more in the kind of procurement, supply chain, sustainability space, but of course it's available to anyone who wants to use it. Um, and uh, really it's to, to kind of come up with a harmonized approach to supplier engagement on decarbonization. Um, and suppliers can then also cascade that information down to their own value chain as well. So uh, I'm not going to take you through the whole guide. As I said, it's free, and I really encourage everybody to go on, take a look at it. Um, but I'll just walk you through kind of the general framework of what we're working with. Um, so the uh, engagement guide itself is set up. We've got kind of four pillars across the top, and then uh, a, a fifth pillar of collaboration that kind of runs uh, transversal through the whole process. But um, each of the four pillars is set up with three distinct recommendations. And then each recommendation itself covers the why, what, and how piece of it. And uh, the, I think these questions here are really key because um, it, you know, it helps obviously educate people who are using the guide itself, but it can also serve as a tool to help get buy-in from um, executives in your own company, working with other functions. Um, so really, this should help kind of not only educate, but help, uh, help serve as a kind of discussion tool as well. Um, 
So each of the pillars there, as I said, has um, has information and examples of actions. So you can actually like, download actual, uh, you know, supplier contracts and um, sort of discussion guides and things like that. Um, so the foundation piece uh, focuses on you know, the key elements around getting management commitment, um, actually setting a 1.5 degree target for your suppliers, and then going about that like greenhouse gas uh, hot spotting of your supplier base as well. Uh, the procurement piece is kind of around getting your internal ducks in a row, so making sure that you have educated all of the different functions internally, you've updated, all of the documents you needed to, um, you've maybe thought about how you're going to incentivize suppliers uh, to work towards decarbonization, um, and then uh, you're also starting to let your suppliers know, hey, here are our updated requirements and what we're going to be working on with you. Uh, the supplier engagement piece is actual kind of step-by-step -step guidance on how to discuss with your suppliers around decarbonization, free resources, points them to on greenhouse gas accounting, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then the reporting piece focuses on, okay, how do you actually set a cadence and requirements on what you're going to expect your suppliers to report on their carbon emissions, um, and then kind of takes you through how then you're going to report on that information yourself within your own company. Um, and the last piece here on collaboration and innovation, and we'll talk more about that later in the session, is around, okay, what do we do now uh, to help spearhead and move the needle even faster? Because we, we need to pilot programs, we need to be working um, collaboratively as we go through this decade of changes that we talked about and solutions um, to really decarbonize faster. Uh, so now we will hand it over to Matt's right, is that Yeah, correct? please. Um, I love the well, seeds uh, are taking over. Okay, good. Matt. All right. Matt, so that's <laughs> great. Okay. I don't, yeah. I, don't, yes. so, I don't have any slides, so um, <laughs> and maybe I can, you, Matt, let's keep it like a simple for everybody. Don't touch. Anyway, uh, I can, I think you, what, well, doesn't work? Does work, it doesn't work. Somebody's turned it off. Yes, exactly. So that's, that's a cheeky move. That's <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful word. Uh, anyway, so, um, yes, supply chain. I think you can see a pattern here, really, about what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. So, um, <clears throat> starting off, I, I told you in the previous, if you want here, already way back in, in, in 2018 when we created the playbook and working with sort of starting with supply chain leaders and, and moving up to this. Uh, it's really about helping others, right? And, and this guy is about helping yourself. Because in a big company like Ericsson, we have a couple of hundred people working with suppliers. And, and they also need help to understand this and, and help their suppliers to work with, with the climate topics. So to make that happen, we need to sort of get them trained. And, and that's sort of the background to, to creating this guide where BSR ha has done a magnificent job of sort of structuring this and, 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 and driving it into to something that is usable for internally in your organizations, but also to work with your suppliers and, and, and share it. So I think that that is, is really what we see. And, and, and also, we heard Laura talk about uh, the, the non-pledge of being part of this whole exponential roadmap initiative. Uh, I think, I mean, from Ericsson's side, we have signed, I think, around 200, or to be honest, we counted, over 200 pledges uh, from starting before Paris and, and moving up to Paris and then all the way to now. And never in ever since then has anybody come back to us and asked, so what did you do? Did you meet your pledge? Right? In these work, you qualify to be part of it. It's about action. It's about showing that you're doing that. It's about demonstrating that through public reporting and driving things. So for us, uh, from Ericsson's side, we then took the decision to have our suppliers set one and a half degree targets. And to be honest, we didn't do that through the playbook because these are 
sort of the 150 biggest suppliers we have that are responsible for 90% of our supply chain emissions. And we work directly with those 150, and we included them another 200, so it's 350 suppliers that we have a target that we sort of follow up on a daily basis. And we do that much more sort of thoroughly than through these tools. But then we have 24,500 suppliers totally, so the rest, the 20, 4,350 suppliers that are not responsible for 90%, but the rest of the 10%, they also need to get going. And they are sort of responsible for, for big emissions for other customers and so on, and we wanted to help them too. So that's sort of the background to the whole work and the process of driving this. And I think for us it's all about uh, uh, moving towards the, the, the ones that are not generally part of these meetings and probably not listening now either but working with them directly, we can really make the change. So I think that is what Ericsson has done, and we have started with setting those targets, and then we are working together, and as I said also previously, we can inspire our customers, and if you look on sort of the list of companies that are part of the one and a half degree supply chain leaders and are working with these guys, a lot of them are our customers <clears throat> that we have managed to convince to be part of it, because if we as an industry work together, and then that has been sort of joined by also other tech companies. So tech sector is pretty heavy here. So uh, Andreas, I think you're next up or soon up. It's also important to challenge the whole furniture sector and um, everybody else in that sector and, and getting all sectors to move into this. So uh, on that, I say thank you for Thank that. you. Thank you so much, Max. Max, please. Come back up here again, um, and uh, would you pass them your mic? Thank you very much. Because I'm coming for you. <laughs> who has questions? We didn't feel confident doing this in the first session, but now who has questions? Uh, perhaps about the barriers. Perhaps about how it's going. Who has thoughts or questions about the 1.5? I'm going to come. I'm going to come to the gentleman here, then the lady, then the gentleman behind. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, Marty Spitzer with World Wildlife Fund. And Mats, I really appreciate uh, the journey you are just describing in terms of getting that 90% of your uh, supply chain to engage in the, in the roadmap being a way to help the rest. Can you talk a little bit about the leverage that you have with the suppliers? Uh, we work with a lot of companies and they have challenges. There's a different philosophy about how heavy-handed, they might want to be with their suppliers. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how, how receptive and how they respond and what your biggest levers are for driving those changes, whether it's going to be one-on-one -on -one or using uh, the roadmap? Uh, I think, uh, and thank you for that question, I think uh, what we have seen on our target is that we have changed the target every half years to strengthen it when it comes to sort of having uh, all of the uh, 90 or suppliers responsible for the 90% plus the strategic suppliers uh, having one and a half degree targets by 2025 and stop reporting and sort of tracking their progress as well in parallel. Um, it's going faster than we thought, so there is a great momentum there and a lot of sort of engagement. Probably it's sort of the early movers that are strong and, and doing that and there are pretty many among those because probably they hire medium suppliers and feel the pressure. So I think that that is, is going very well. Uh, there we are very strong on sort of uh, the engagement and uh, the leverage. When it comes to how we drive it, uh, and that's, I think we have shared it also on, on sort of these tools. Uh, the way that we put requirements on suppliers, and we have done that sort of jointly, so it's not Ericsson's only requirements, it's sort of more generic requirements that are in, in the SME Climate Hub and, and on, on sort of the supply chain leaders, web pages and so on, examples of how we can put requirements on the suppliers. They are strict requirements, so they are part of it, and, and the second part is, is really that, that uh, uh, we will follow that up when we have a report. Thank you so very much. We're going to try to get to two more questions. Fabulous. Hi, uh, CJ George from Accenture. I'm curious about the non-compliance, um, how you handle that, and, and how 
you know, as these companies are, are setting, as your suppliers are setting targets, how do you both have the carrot and the stick around non-compliance and how you're kind of gathering data to report and validate um, at what cadence, I guess? I think, uh, to be brief, we are sort of soft on the outside and hard on the inside, so we start very gently. Uh, to work with them and help them. Uh, and so, so a lot of carrot with the stick in the contract, not using the stick yet, uh, because I think this is a journey uh, and, and we need to sort of have some patience with companies that haven't worked with this. So that is, yeah. Diane, would you like to go on that? Yeah, I think just to say that what there was a little bit of a shift in perspective on, on this, right? I think, um, a few years ago, there was kind of a red line. If you don't meet this, you know, you're, you're out as a supplier. But what we found is that companies that hadn't set aggressive targets with their suppliers um, uh, just picked those suppliers up, right? And so if, we, if we're looking at this as a global problem, like, we can't just say, we're not going to work with you anymore. I mean, I, I do think it's very important to have a line where, you know, you can't cross that, but um, really pushing towards, you know, educating the suppliers and helping uh, transform everyone together. And we see that if, you know, entire geographies are kind of raising the bar, then, then you know, everybody moves forward together. So um, it's, it's challenging because you, you do have to have some point where you say, like, okay, we're, we're not going to work with you anymore, for sure. But um, I think, you know, the incentivization mechanisms really help on that. Um, that Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Brilliant. Hello, I'm Thomas from The Switch, and what you guys are demonstrating is decarbonization through your value chain. And now you're asking your suppliers to essentially do the same. So you've been through the challenge of embedding this cultural change through all the levels of your management, it, it appears. What I'm curious about, because most companies out there have not done this, even if this room sort of makes it feel a little bit that everyone is doing this. So I'm curious to hear how many years would you say that it typically takes to realistically create that cultural change that you're asking your suppliers to execute? Mm. Probably realistically, it's a you know three year process to really like get really get ingrained the movement within the organization. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the most important part is creating a coalition of the willing in your company. So working with the ones that are positive and not try to beat your head against the ones that don't want to work. And I think it's the same with suppliers and others. So really working and, and with companies like this working with the ones and really driving change. So that is uh, the recipe to success across the board. And then, uh, I mean, you change management now and then, so it's an endless process. <laughs> endless, yes. Endless. Yes. And I'm going to just take this and squeeze one very quiet final compression because he basically grabbed me as I was passing. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. A quick question then related more to me, but I'm Ramiro Fernandez, campaign director of Rate to Zero. Um, and re regarding these 150 suppliers that you have that you're prioritizing, how do they report their sort of their progress and emissions reductions, and how do you collect this information? Which, which are the reporting platforms there? Yeah, uh, very briefly. Um, currently, it's a manual process. Of course, most of them are high emitting suppliers, so they are on CDP, so we can collect the data. Uh, we have also worked together within this to create a tool for reporting. Uh, so so uh, when that tool is ready, we will collect the data through that tool, which will be sort of compatible with CDP as well. So, so um, but currently, the target is for them to set the target. Right, so, so uh, a one and a half degree target. So that is uh, the starting point, and, and I think it did to put them on the journey to understand this, the pain of everything. As I said, starting, this is sort of a pattern that you can probably see now, having been here. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Matt. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, it's my absolute pleasure.
pleasure now, just to wait for one second, <laughs> and to invite um, uh, Besma uh, Alajabu up to join us to speak around the absolute centrality and, and crucial of renewable energy and how, we, how we're supporting our supply chains to make that great transition. Thank uh, Besma, thank you. Oh, no, Besma's already all mic'd up. We'll see. Oh, good. Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm Basma Jarbo. I lead supplier carbon solutions at Apple. I'm really excited to be here in person with all of you this week. Um, at Apple, you know, we've always designed with people at the center of everything that we do. Um, and for decades, we've led the industry in our work on smarter and safer chemistry. You know, making our products safe for those who we use and make and recycle the products. Um, and at the, an example of that was our move to halogen-free cables in 2012. And about 15 years ago, we really started to expand our focus to climate change. Um, this took the form of really operating more efficiently and using renewable energy. In 2018, we achieved 100% renewable energy for all of our operations, corporate operations. So every data center, every corporate office, every store in 44 countries is running on 100% renewable energy. And all of those renewable energy projects, 90% of them were new, additional, Apple-created projects. We then get to 2020. Um, and in 2020, we uh, achieved carbon neutrality for our entire corporate operations. And that was also the year that we announced that we were going to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030 for our entire products. So that is all of our product manufacturing and the entire life cycle um, of our products, including the product use and the product recycling. So when you look at our footprint, 70% um, of the remaining footprint is in the product manufacturing, and, and that's really what, what I target. Um, and the majority of that is electricity. So scope 3 has been on our mind for a long time. And uh, we launched in 2015 our supplier energy efficiency program and our supplier clean energy program. Um, we ask all of our suppliers to make a contractual commitment to use 100% renewable energy for their Apple production. And so today we have over 200 suppliers committed to that program. Uh, that is over 70% of our manufacturing spend committed to renewable energy. We have 16 gigawatts of commitments and 10 gigawatts that are already online. Then we have our next audacious goal. Can we make, but not take, can we make all of our products using only recycled and renewable materials? Can we end our reliance on mining? This involves paying attention to detail very early on in the design stage and to every material that goes into our products. We, um, in this last year, we announced on all of our products that were announced, we achieved about 20% recycled content with the 13-inch MacBook Air achieving 44% recycled content. But we design our products to be durable and long-lasting and to be passed on from owner to owner. But when they end their useful life, please, 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 please get the word out and bring them back to us through our training program because we will recycle and we will reuse the material in it. And for a figure that might stick in your mind, for every one metric ton of the components of an iPhone that we get back and we recycle with our own robots, you're avoiding the equivalent of 2,000 tons of mined rock for coal, for copper and gold. So get your devices back to us, please. <laughs> um, with all of this work, I mean, we have now reduced our carbon footprint by 40% since 2015. Um, but with all the work, it's about how you do it, in addition to like, the progress that is being made, right? And so we are committed to reducing our footprint by 75%. And for the remaining footprint, those are the direct emissions that are just too difficult to abate or decarbonize in the next seven years. By 2030, we will turn to high-quality nature-based renewables. And, I, you know, and climate change is a far-reaching and impactful crisis, um, and with crisis comes opportunity. We, um, we've all seen during the pandemic how we are all interconnected, how vulnerable we all are, 
and that it's the simple things in life that really, really bring joy to us. So we really see through the environmental work that this is an opportunity for us all to reshape and make the world a better place. And, and with that, it's, it's really thinking about people at the center of everything. Right? And environmental justice is human justice. Environmental rights are human rights. Um, and every solution that we, that we pursue really needs to be good for both people and planet. So oh, this uh, shows kind of uh, the progress that we have made over the years. Um, this past year, even though our revenue grew 33%, we kept our net emissions flat. Right? So we are decoupling revenue growth from emissions. It's showing that our, our programs and our supply chain programs are really scaling. They're really, um, they're successful. Uh, and they are not just um, reducing our footprint, but they're also making our supply chain more resilient. We don't have all the answers, <laughs> we don't pretend to, but what we do have are our goals and our commitments and a community of businesses and organizations that are, are really committed to getting this work done. Um, very excited to be here with you all and to connect um, so that we can all amplify this work, accelerate this work through uh, collaboration and innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you to perhaps stay because you are sitting quite far in, if you wouldn't mind, whilst uh, Andreas comes up and makes a few comments, because I'm then going to um, see if there's any questions for you, if that's okay. Thank you. Andreas, from Ikea. Yes. I said, you want to buy more of yours? Yes. Let's see. Yeah, just turn it on. So, hello everybody. So, my name is uh, Andreas Angel Arms. I lead the Global Climate Agenda at Ikea. So it's part of how we reinvent uh, supply chains, I'll talk about how we support our suppliers to purchase renewable electricity as well as generate as much as possible can on site. So we talked about this when we launched the playbook earlier this morning as well, that IKEA's own emissions is our total value chain emissions, because these only are here due to IKEA's business. We also talk about IKEA's range is our identity. So we don't like to talk about scope one, two, three. We of course have one, one, two, three here included, but these are our emissions. The rest is just accounting. So this is our responsibility, and we are committed to half this until 2030. And then how do you do it? Well, I could spend a lot of time to go through each and every step, but let's focus on the suppliers. So with tier one, we have production, this is where we manufacture our products, like the billy bookcase, the fax wardrobe, the meatballs. Uh, people always laugh when I talk about meatballs. I should say plant balls, right? That's why I like it. Uh, as well as all product transports, so the shipping and the heavy goods transports that we are transporting our products from the factories to the warehouses and stores where you as customers can buy them. And overall what we found is that we have set up different portfolios or different like offers for how to actually support our suppliers to actually invest or purchase renewable electricity. We started pushing a lot on the on-site generation uh, leading up to in Madrid, we launched 100 million uh, financing of renewable energy investments. Uh, but what we realized is that that only takes us 15% on average of a supplier's electricity consumption. So you only have so much root space uh, on your factory or connected to it to cover your electricity. We need to find other alternatives for the remaining 85%. And that's why last spring we actually also launched then a program to support our suppliers to purchase renewable electricity. Because we realized this, that suppliers have made business cases for on-site generation, but they had an issue to actually purchase it from a grid, depending on the market. At the same time, we had a part of our purchasing department which supported and purchased electricity for IKEA's own operations. We thought, couldn't they do it for our suppliers? And after a year of change management, they were really excited uh, to do this. Uh, it's about the, you need to know what we're getting into. Uh, but now we're really positive, so I'm not lying, they're really crazy uh, in a positive way. 
Um, so we asked them, can you just purchase it for Visitars? And we could have actually purchased it for Visitars, but what we do is that we bundle the electricity consumption of suppliers and we have one project per country. So we just collect it and then we negotiate a framework agreement and let our suppliers join very well. And now it's a bit early. If you would ask me in four weeks, I could have actually shown what the result in Poland was. But I can already tease you that we have secured quite a lot of renewable electricity from new installations, as well as that could cut electricity price in our biggest, uh, one of our biggest manufacturing countries, which is a good sign with the soaring energy prices as well. So this is actually a win-win from both business and sustainability. And this is that business, sorry, everybody could adopt it. But of course, we also need to support with energy efficiency. So how do we support that? It could also be offsetting premium costs. And if we realize that at least the first wave of countries that we're doing for Poland, India, and China, we actually will save as much CO2 as we emit from all ocean transports on a, weekly, a yearly basis. So this is really huge impact that you can have. And how we work with it, that we work very analytically, just taking all of the information from our supplies that reported, work analytically. How much can we generate on site? What needs to be purchased on our grid? What do we add with electrification, etc.? And then we identify initiatives like this and also can realize what this uh, outcome is. I cannot say how big this is, but it's uh, only one of those countries, so it's going to be big, what we announce in a few weeks. So with this, I hope this part companies that you can actually look into existing setups in your business or start a purchasing department to support suppliers or join forces with other companies. And we, from our side, are happy to share this setup uh, with any other company so we can really accelerate action within supply chains. Thank you. Grab that, come on in. Okay, I'm beginning to get how this works, one to one. So, who has questions for Vesna or for Andres about how they've done this? Right at the back. Hello, thanks, Ali. Uh, my name is Vivian, ex veteran. Uh, nowadays, I'm leading sustainability at Grace. Grace is a marketing tech company, and we're very on, early on our journey. Uh, on sustainability, we just completed our first footprint and are looking at climate strategy now. So, um, I'm curious, we realize that renewable energy is going to be a big focus. And um, how did you first get started in terms of, kind of the first two years? You know, what are the focus projects? And what was the rationale behind those? And I shall say that we don't really have any operational control over our facilities. so. I think uh, particularly when it comes to any uh, lease facilities or data centers, how did you go about there to, uh, yeah, to invest in renewable energy? Yes. You, you, you don't need the mic, you already mic'd up. Oh. That's, that's the, the mic's on this. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It sounds like your question was a bit um, about your own corporate footprint, right? And, and it sounds like you're a smaller, maybe smaller electricity footprint, and you don't own your own facilities. <laughs> right. And, um, there are, I mean, numerous offer. So there are a number of options available, and depending on what country that you're in, um, I think uh, you know you can always uh, turn to your landlord. I think the policy advocacy side is really important. Um, especially when you're smaller and you're distributed, that has more power than almost than, than you kind of just going it alone and just trying to figure out your own footprint. Um, I know that there are, at least in the U.S., when you look at the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance, there is a movement within that group to focus and target landlords. Um, so that, that's one thing that gets me excited. It's like the smaller voices all banding together and being able to kind of just increase the attention to, to your demand. Yeah, and to really go in all the way back, is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, to go all the way back when we set our climate goals at IKEA, um, we have to go back in time, because I, mean, I think we kind of forget that with the Paris Agreement, that was a huge transformational change, going from always improving efficiency to just being slightly less bad, to really addressing the root cause. And when I got that project, it was like, can we even lose our absolute emissions? Or can we even reduce our emissions in absolute terms? 
So that was a whole problem statement. So the first one year, one and a half, we spent just based on all the data we had to just consolidate that, update models, doing scenario planning to see how much will the footprints grow and what initiatives can we actually can we identify that can reduce it and how much. And that has been really well invested time where we're still utilizing a lot. So what I showed here for renewable electricity, we already knew how big it was and how much we need to purchase from the grid already five years ago, but we had no way of actually how to do it. So we're still tapping into those bits. The plant ball also came from that work as well. So I think it's really to understand your footprint, doing a thorough analytical assessment, and also understanding what can you influence and not, and in what way can you influence it as well. You can also maybe choose to go to another company, a building, for instance. I mean, if you can't change, or if you can't affect the land, well, change one. Uh, so that's also a way to really assess the factions. Thank you so very much. I'm so sorry, I have like 50 questions for you, but I'm going to ask them afterwards because we have got wonderful more speakers to come in. So can we thank Andreas and uh, thank Vesna. <laughs> right, so we're getting through structures, we're getting through how do you incentivize, we're getting through renewable energy. Let's keep going. So um, we're going to move now to actually some companies who perhaps are in supply chains. Um, and also radical innovation. What does it take to actually innovate within this area? Do you know what? I'm not sure the words innovation and supply chains actually come together anywhere near enough. But as someone who is in quite a lot of your supply chains, I mean your supply chain, your supply chain, um, actually there's a lot of innovation that can be brought from within the supply chain itself. That there's a lot of uh, lateral thinking, there's a lot of room for manoeuvre within supply chains. So I'm so excited to um, invite up uh, uh, Frederica Kahn, Head of Sustainability at Polestar, who I think are an incredibly innovative company. Thank you. Let me get the mouse work. Hi everyone, so happy to be here. I, I get a really good boost of hope and confidence when listening to, to all of these amazing people and, and the ongoing work that we are doing in our companies. So Polestar, let me say, my name is Rilke Kalle and I work with sustainability at Polestar. Polestar is a young electric vehicle company based in, in Gothenburg and we were founded in this you know, significant time where we know what we know. Uh, but in this climate rampant, in, in this rampant climate crisis, we also see that there are solutions, and electric vehicles is a very powerful climate solution already today. But it is maybe also the most underutilized climate solution today. There is no EV boom really. If you look at markets like Sweden and Norway and China, there is an amazing progress in terms of sales. But if we look at the global car stock only one and a half percent of cars are electrified in 2022. And that is not where we need to be to show up in time in the climate crisis. So for Polestar, a lot of our work is really about advocating for an accelerated transition um, and really um, showing data and numbers that can back that up. But we also want to talk about the fact that as an industry now, we need to, sorry, we need to secure that we take this time and actually try to redefine how we produce cars. Because looking at an a, a electric vehicle, we see that it comes with a lot of debt in terms of carbon when it comes to the production of batteries and the cars. So life cycle assessment is the beating heart of, of our sustainability work. We were able to um, develop a methodology together with Volvo when we produce Polestar 2. We are an affiliate to Volvo. Uh, their XC40 Polestar 2 car is built on the same platform as Polestar 2, uh, which means that a lot of the big chunks in the car, the chassis, the battery, and so on, is basically uh, very similar. Um, so we want to compare the carbon footprint of the Polestar 2 based on three charging scenarios with the XC40 ICE car or petrol car. So we clearly saw that we can move away from the question on whether or not electric vehicles are better or worse than petrol cars. Looking at climate emissions over the life cycle, they are absolutely better, a better choice today. We also saw that we can go for full climate neutrality 
on electric vehicles in a way that we, of course, never could on the petrol car. Um, we can absolutely secure that electric vehicles, the promise that they deliver on climate neutrality, is fulfilled if we only now start focusing on the production-related emissions. A lot of money is still put into legacy technology in the oil water sector, just upholding the status quo. What if we would take all of those money and put it into innovation, for example? We, as a young company, set out to um, establish an ambitious climate uh, strategy. I've been told that we have a typo in this one. I would, I would not be very good if we would have set out to have the missions by 2025. But as members of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we have committed to having the missions by 2030. As a growing company, uh, that means to produce this climate solution and get it out on the market, we of course need to um, create more emissions, unfortunately, due to production. But we have set out to decouple uh, our growth uh, from, from climate emissions. So we, we are absolutely striving towards halving our relative emissions to 2030. And we also now want to create a sense of urgency around the fact that we have to figure out how to make climate neutral cars, and we have to do this, this, this decade. We cannot wait until after 2030. So we create a, a truly a moonshot goal for ourselves to, to create this climate neutral car by 2030. We, we didn't have a clue on how to do it. A car consists of 30,000 plus components. Um, we don't even have data from all parts of the supply chain yet. Uh, but we know we have to do it, and we have to make it clear to our designers and engineers that it's really up to them to now start finding the solutions. So we created a project called the post Zero Project, and uh, we do not run that from the sustainability department at Polestar. It's an R&D department. It's all about research and innovation right now. We have decided to focus on the create gate emissions and also the end of life emissions. But of course, in our climate strategy, we work to promote renewable energy and the charging uh, and the use space, of course, as well. We will not accept offsetting from suppliers or from anyone else uh, in this. We focus on eliminating both direct and indirect emissions from the production of cars. The time plan we have for this project is based in three phases. So, as I said, it's all about research right now. We have to, when we get to 25, know what kind of materials we can use in this car. Because I want to make clear also that this is not a concept car. This is a car that you all will be able to buy in 2030. It's going to have wheels and a steering wheel and everything. You're going to be able to sit in it. Uh, it's going to be a performance car. We are a performance brand as well. Um, so we really have to know by 2025 exactly what kind of materials we can start engineering with. And uh, mid-decade, it's got all going to be about building the architecture, applying the science to our architecture. And then the last three years will be a product development phase much like any other in, in a car company, really. We cannot do this alone, of course. We have put out call to actions twice this year um, to secure that we now attract the right partners who want to join this project, this very specific project. Uh, and we have an amazing lineup already now. We have gained so much attention with this call to action in such a positive way. Um, for example, we have major players like, like Swedish steelmaker SSAB joining us. We have uh, Norsk Hydro, who's an aluminium producer. We have Pensana, rare earth elements uh, mining. We have Paper Shell, an innovative startup in Sweden, uh, working with, with bio based material as a replacement to plastics. Orderly safety functions, for example. And the amazing thing about them joining is. First and foremost, it's very brave. When, when suppliers and partners really come to us, I don't think that they have understood that we really talk about net zero, that we are eliminating 
every single emission in this project. Uh, so they are so brave uh, to sign up for this project. And also, they, they supply to so many other industries. So the solutions that we will create in terms of how to produce uh, fossil-free aluminium, we actually have direct emissions from, fossil, from, from aluminium production. If they can provide a solution now to all of their customers, where it's completely fossil-free, this project is going to have bigger implications than only for our car, of course. Advocacy is also a big part of what we do. We know that we have a spotlight um, because we're an exciting new company and, and, and we want to use that spotlight and really talk about what matters. We uh, went to COP26 last year and said we were going to take notes on how the automotive industry as a whole really signed up now to, to the one and a half degree pathway. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see commitment from from most of the automotive industry, we, we, we saw silence. Uh, we're coming back to COP27 to remind them again that we have to align, we have to create this common platform, and they can join post zero whenever they want. Transparency is a huge uh, part in this, of course. We're embracing radical transparency as a, as a young company. Uh, we have part of sustainability declaration, very inspired by Apple. Um, in this, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we want to enable customers to now understand the impact of the choice that they're making, that it's, it's not unproblematic, but that it's better. Um, consumers today actively distrust the automotive industry. How will we get them along for this transition if they cannot trust us? So we're declaring the carbon footprint of all of our parts and all of the variants and all other different important sustainability aspects that is that is good to know as a consumer. So you will get to follow our journey. Also incremental changes is so important for us. We not only talk about 2030, but we talk about what we can, can we do here now. We have facelifts in the automotive industry uh, when you get to do changes on a model year update. Uh, we have decided that we don't want to just work with facelift, we want to work with sustainable upgrades. So uh, this spring, when we launched our model year update for, for Postdoc 2, we were able to show that we could cut uh, 1.3 tons on the carbon footprint just by resourcing uh, the aluminium to the battery tray and to the rims. These are boring, non-innovative changes that you can make, but they will have so much impact in the coming years. So yes, let's talk about radical innovation and 2030 and, and beyond, but absolutely, let's also remind ourselves that we need to talk about incremental changes here and now, and we also have to just realize that that might be boring, but very needed to talk about. That was it from me. Thank you so much. Sir. I say it doesn't sound boring at all. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to ask Federica, maybe perhaps you might want to just sit in and take a seat because I'm now going to ask um, Eva Carlson. So Eva Carlson is the CEO of, uh, of a company of which I think I, I own and wear two things and clearly I need to upgrade that to many, many more. So Houdini is a very innovative apparel uh, company and uh, uh, would you like to come Eva and tell a little bit of the Houdini story? Yes, thanks. So inspiring to be here, and I hope that I can add some uh, perspective, but uh, yeah, great work. Happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. And you don't need that much gear. Maybe you need a couple of pieces or whatever. Um, <clears throat> we're designing a, or enabling a life, um, as we look at it, where you can have fewer products that can do more for you. And we all know that the world doesn't need more clothing or stuff. Just better stuff. Houdini, a Swedish outdoor brand based in Stockholm. And we've been design, designing for circularity since 2001. And when we say circular, we look at nature as the blueprint for what, what circular means to us. It's not only a flow of natural resources, it's a flow of that for sure, that has to be circular, but it's also a flow of products, 
how can we share more and how can we uh, extend the product lifetime immensely, I'll get back to that. But also, how can we share knowledge, just like knowledge is distributed in nature, it's distributed um, in a way that is open source, I would say. So how do we move to, to that phase in the context of circular? And this is our vision. The, play, the places we love and the lifestyle that we want to live, but to do that without having a negative impact. Of course, that has to be our goal. And moving beyond towards regenerative, it's going to be a, a long journey, of course. And 2001 is when we started this journey towards circular, next steps to regenerative. And uh, we have been working a lot with what Fredrik and uh, you spoke about, which is about collaboratively working with suppliers to radically, radically change material design and so forth towards circular products. Uh, and when doing that, we've had uh, a lot of help with working with the planetary boundaries framework. Because it's, it's not only about climate impact in terms of carbon emissions, it's about understanding the planetary system in its entirety and how it's interconnected and how if we start using more wood pulp, for instance, what does that do to climate in an extended timeline? So it's about all of these uh, piece of the pieces of the pie, climate, land system, oceans, and so forth, and understanding or catching the rhythm of the Earth system. Um, it's not. It's very complex. Sometimes we have need to hold hands with scientists. And uh, after two decades of work on uh, our journey towards circular, for sure, there's a lot of tricky questions that we need to ask ourselves and need scientists to help us out to find the solutions and answers. But there is also an, a strength in just this as a mind map to ask ourselves the right questions. And I know that we have to get into action as well and not stay forever with the questions, but we do need to ask ourselves the difficult questions and kind of feel okay without, without with not knowing all the answers. Um, and not take uh, a new direction which sounds or feels good, but actually ends up just moving missions elsewhere. And then forging partnerships with nature. The, the, the planetary boundaries might be a, um, like a platform to stand on, but then I think it's more of a spiritual um, storytelling, emotional drive that we need to have as humans. Uh, and that is looking at ourselves as part of that system. We are not here to consume nature. We're here to become part of it again. And that's how we, we can... Uh, I'm a bit afraid, and I think that I saw a film this morning, uh, being here in New York, and realizing that we cannot stay in the technological solutions and think that everything is going to be okay. We need to reconnect to nature and become part of it and, and realize that it's this mind shift or spiritual thing combined with new technologies that's going to make us uh, reach the goals of 1.5 degrees. So we're about 80% circular today. We're moving towards 2030 when we've said that we want to have a circular East ecosystem in, in its entirety. And that means everything that's production, we work with tier one to tier four in our supply chain. Uh, but it's also consumption, and I think that is really, really hopeful and inspiring work that we do now, and more now than uh, a decade ago. Because consumption is a place where we can, at least in apparel, do magnificent changes. Disruptive, in a, in a sense, that moves us uh, low-tech or no-tech towards uh, the climate uh, future that we want to see. We're part of an industry that is a three tri trillion dollar take make waste industry. Tons of design flaws, some are really easy to fix, others are really difficult. But that's the situation. And on the consumer, consumer side then, there are 100 billion garments produced every year. And 60% of those are discarded within the first year. It's completely crazy, of course. And easy to become uh, a 
leader, I, I guess. Uh, but still, there's uh, we are in this context, and we can we can trick each other or ourselves into moving mainstream. So we have to reimagine everything, and we have to start raising those questions again and again in order to do it right. And those questions have to be at every level. Systems like microplastics or ocean systems, and then technologies all the way down to fiber or chemicals. And uh, examples of how we can make it easy in the daily operations with a design checklist. Asking ourselves, does this product deserve existence? It's a very good question. I think that many products might not be <laughs> designed or produced. Will it age with beauty? Uh, and so forth. And open source, uh, to share knowledge. Uh, we're a small company, we don't need to be, intend to be the biggest, but then scaling our knowledge and creating ripples far outside of our company is really, really important. And there's no winner if there's only one winner. In this journey, we all become winners or losers. Just a few things I was thinking about in terms of value chain, uh, value chain for us and uh, everything from customer and end of life and all the way back, upstream, downstream, relations. I think we've been much more transactional as corporations for a long, long time and we need to move back to a relational economy. And I think we've heard a lot of examples like that here today on how we work very close and uh, uh, long term with, with uh, our suppliers rather than jump back and forth to get the lowest price or whatever. Culture, there's a lot of things in culture, uh, corporate culture and the consumerism that we can redesign. Ownership, it's an interesting thing to see how we see ownership now as something where we have the right not only to, come to use, but to discard or destroy. Maybe we need to ask ourselves the question, what can circular, what can circular ownership be in the future? Maybe become caretakers and investors in a brighter future rather than the old type of ownership, which is linear. We explore circular business models, care and repair to extend product lifetime, and we've done so for a decade. And cultivating caretakers and co-creators. I think I'm, I realize myself that I use a lot of words that are kind of um, the words that um, farmer would use. Cultivate um, or nature, maybe. But this is a uh, last little comment. Live large with less. I think it's really important. I, I don't think that people here uh, at Climate Week are bringing tons of apparel to show off, uh, but the fashion weeks that are coming up, uh, for sure, do. Uh, but live large with less, I think, is a, is a mind shift challenge. Maybe we can use a lot more great products for more rather than add tons of stuff to our wardrobe or our homes. Um, this is a simple formula just to remind ourselves uh, of how we can measure and understand and work towards lower impact or eliminating elimin impact. It's not about only product design and product production, but it's about the volumes we produce or the wardrobes that we have, and it's for sure about the lifestyle we inspire and enable. That is how we can mitigate impact and improve. For which nature? That's our journey. Off electricity. Does anyone have any questions for Frederica um, and for Ava? Particularly in terms of the innovation. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello, I'm Yelitsa. I'm a master's student at NYU for environmental and energy law. And I'm also doing a research of textile and PR policy globally. So I'm very interested in your presentation, Ava. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, if you could. Tell us a little bit more about your reuse uh, system um, and take back system 
how was it effective, do a lot of your customers actually use those actions, and are the products that they return, are they really usable, how usable are they, are you able to see the fabric, or do they, like, um, I'm guessing that the clothes that you're making are made out of a more sustainable materials, so if you could also just tell us a little bit the materials that you use. Yes, thanks. Uh, we did a user survey um, year, a couple of years ago, uh, because of course we've designed our products to be long-lasting and circular, but in the context of today maybe they're used to fast fashion items anyway. Uh, but it's nice to see, and we, we of course know also from repair services that we've done for decades, that there's a lot of people who fall in love and also stay in love with the products if they're designed in the right way, meaning that they will repair them and care for them. And, in, and I think that the, the average user uh, used their Houdini garments for more than 10 years, several times a week for many different activities. So adding up, that's more than a thousand times, while the European, and I assume also the US average is seven to 10 times. So there's radical improvements to make. A hundred times long, more use of the resources that we, that we extract from the earth, for instance, uh, that, that, uh, that can reduce both uh, production and consumption. I'm a customer, I run to the pants when I go uh, skinny. It's also really good because I seem to uh, change shape for every year after <laughs> four weeks, so it's super convenient for many reasons. So I have a quick question for both of you. Um, also as a small business myself, um, I think there's obviously challenges. We don't necessarily have the scale or the money or the lawyers that some of the bigger companies do. But there's also advantages, in, particularly in terms of speed and being able to get things done. So, um, uh, what, what is your big hope of what you're going to be able to do next as businesses, which perhaps might be at speed? Because we've got, we, obviously, um, for you spoke about the car, we're sort of like, what's your big dream of what you're going to be able to do next? Because you both have an enormous amount of decision making within your organizations. So, Federica. Uh, with the, the research we need to do now with Impulse or Zero, having these solutions ready by 2025 when, we, when we're going to start mixing what's in the car. We're going to have to speed up research in a way that is not common. So uh, that is our uh, whole drive now when it comes to, um, to Postal Zero, finding ways to research quicker so that we actually can take action. Um, so that is the example. But that, that there is so much to speed up, really. <laughs> I, I think research what, is what actually, we not speed up. I think research is a great answer yeah. in terms of the, the need for more innovation. And Eva, what are you going to speed up? Well, uh, I think that uh, the cultural shift, the mind shift, is what I have hope, most hope for because that can move at exponential rate. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure that is going to be slow, um, but for sure, I, that makes, gives me hope. Uh, the mind shift that I think that we're seeing now. Reconnecting to nature, understanding the value of nature, and so forth. And then I would say the most important thing is to have policymakers make sure that we can scale sustainable technologies that have already been in, in, invented. Uh, and then, for sure, innovation as well. I love innovation, but I do believe that scaling what is, we have a lot of solutions that we're not implementing at scale. Brilliant, thank you both very much. I look forward to driving a Polestar car whilst wearing a 10 year old who did me hatch So, thank you so very much. I'm just going to ask now whether uh, Ramiro uh, Fernandez would like to come forward um, as campaign director at the Climate Champions team and perhaps reflect a little bit on what you've heard this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for the invitation for the speakers. I have to say that for some, someone that has been spending the last couple of years working on a, on a campaign, on the governance of the campaign with 10,000 members and over 30 partners, talking about criteria, pledge, actions, plans, uh, reporting mechanisms, uh, tensions there on specific relation with partners and others. It's been one of the most inspiring meetings I've been. 
hearing to you on the concrete action that you're already taking and how you can see the implications of the, the companies itself and making the large scale of the biggest we have. Uh, and when I, I came to this to go thinking this morning about how, how to address this this summary, and my initial reaction there was definitely the supply chains it is from what we see in race to zero probably one of the major challenges that we are seeing and we're addressing and also the major opportunities. And it just reinforced both elements on this side. And we have, in Red to Zero, we have 10,000, 8,000 companies. More than two thirds of them are SMEs. So, and, so the, and the, the, those two thirds of companies of them are the suppliers of the other 2,000 companies probably in many areas. So you show today the, the level of complexity and interconnectedness that is there. And again, the main, through all the different presentations, all the way through, I was thinking about the principle of radical collaboration that the champions are pushing and calling forward always. And you could see that the supply chain, it is a challenge to connect there and the projections, but also it is a major opportunity to really drive forward this transition and reduce the emissions of the whole, this, I would say, from our perspective, race to zero, these 6,000 SMEs that are there, they need your support and your engagement to reduce their emissions. In fact, I love this concept of radical correlation, how it was reflected in all the areas. I also love to see there how that this can have sort of massive impacts and implications. You know, getting national partners together uh, to negotiate agreements on renewable energy deals, or engaging all the new supplies there. So love it, love it to see that, that implication there. Uh, and specific projects there. Uh, let me see my notes to see if finance comments and summary there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, that, that concept there, talking about helping others by helping ourselves, and very much inspired those pieces. Uh, and also, on the challenge and the complexity, you know, I was asking there about how you measure this, how are your supply chains reporting there? Because what we are seeing, it is, it is so complex and difficult today for what we are having information on how these SMEs are reporting and structure, how you really measure those emissions. And so the tools that we work on BCR, it really helps to simplify this process. So I think we are getting a lot of insight and inspiration to many others on how to accelerate there. Um, and finally, this element about, yeah, we need partnership, we need to work together, we need good processes and mechanisms to, to address and engage the supply chains with this carrot and stick, soft and forward. But the piece of innovation that you brought at the end, uh, I think it really helped us on reframing the operative about this rethinking approach. You know? And the rethinking approach with the ambition goal, this set of, we, if we want to address this, this challenge, we need levels of ambitions and transformations in a speed and scale that we have not seen yet. So setting ourselves, yourself a target of, let's really create a new car absolutely without emissions by 2030, and the implications that that has. Things must, that's the level of ambition of things that we need to see. And you mentioned that about how by doing so and engaging with your partners, you are aiming to have impacts far beyond this car itself, now influencing many other industries. So that reinforces again the interconnectedness. Uh, I really, really like that. And, uh, and we'll finish this saying that as a active skier that works, that really requires a skiing, uh, I'm much more encouraged to see how to use one of those products of Houdini uh, and get it to circulate there. So thank you very much for being an extremely inspiring session today. Learn a lot. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. So um, uh, I think we are now uh, coming right towards the end of this supply chain leader session. I'm just going to ask Johan to stand up and perhaps make a few final comments uh, to close out. The, this session and also the first morning at Solutions House. Well, thank you, Sylvia. <clears throat> I think uh, transformational value chains will be the next the big thing. Not in sustainability, but actually in the business community. I'm absolutely convinced within two years, 
because we will move from waste chains to value chains. What we have today is really incredibly wasteful uh, chains, supply chains, and it will be all about creating value that we heard from a lot of you. And uh, to do that we need innovation and we need collaboration. I think um, a company within two or three years, if you're not part of a value chain, which is aligned with 1.5, and the future, you will be out as a company. So I mean, you basically need to understand your complete value chain. You need to have the right customers, you need to have the right uh, suppliers to be able to grow and thrive. So that I think will happen, but I think uh, in the forefront, you as pioneers can really drive this. In the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, I think we represent, say, 1% of the economy, we think in one. And race to zero is maybe factor 10, the global economy is factor 100. And how we're thinking is, basically, can this one part help to contribute to the factor 10 in the collaboration with race to zero, actually creating the best the practices, the best ideas, the best tools, and just spread it and show that the race to the top will create a competitive advantage. Then we can take it to the next level to actually influence uh, the global economy. So uh, with that, thank you everyone for this uh, first session, which I think have been incredible. Thank you everyone who has contributed. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, you so very much everyone.